Hey, Gecko and Ice Pod fans, it's Wally from Supreme Gecko. And Annette. See, it took us one show to get it back to where we were before. Thanks for joining us tonight. This is going to be a great show. I say that every single show, does don't I? We've had some unbelievable guests, unbelievable guests the last couple of months, and I, I feel blessed <clears throat> to have the people that we have, have had on. Can everybody hear us? Can you see us okay? Uh, Nanette, you want to call out some people here? I was just getting ready here. Hey, Julie is here, and Major WD is here, and Frank the Tank, J-Bug, Gage. Gage Boy. Um, that's all I see right now. Okay. Of course, I can't see everything. Aaron's here. Hi, Aaron. How are you doing? Tonight, Laura's here. Oh, Laura. Thank you for joining us. Tonight, we have Robin Marklin from Redline Shipping. This is exciting because I have... So, how long have we been shipping animals, Nanette? I don't know. 15, 20 years. 15, 20 years. I mean, you were. we started when you were like eight. So, you know. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, it, it feels like a hundred simply because we have had in the last few years a lot of shipments and I'm, I'm not boasting at all. It's just that I'm trying to say that uh, we've gone through enough shipping that we should have this down pat at this point. However, however, I always want to, number one, improve. Number two, find out where I'm making, where we're making mistakes, where Nanette's making mistakes. She's our shipping manager. And I want to make sure that we improve I have a title? all the time. You do have a title. Wow. I, I have a title. Crystal, our granddaughter, gave me a title, remember? I'm the chief uh, dishwasher. Yeah. That's a, a, the official title I have for Supreme Gecko. You're so right. <laughs> we are always looking for ways to improve. And after 15, 20 years, I'm still looking for ways to improve. And I'm going to challenge Robin tonight because we use a specific way of shipping. And Robin's going to come on the show and convince me why Wally Kern with Supreme Gecko needs to change his evil, evil ways and use redline shipping. So this is going to be fun. It's going to be educational. And Robin is such a great guy. I cannot wait for the show tonight. Hi, Julie. Uh, I just see Julie uh, jumping in. She was in earlier. I already said that. Oh, see, I'm I'm already behind in the show. Mm -hmm. um, what did we do Wednesday, Nanette? I don't have Wednesday? anything to drink. Yes, what did we do Wednesday? Today had, is Thursday. We had lunch with... Yesterday, we had lunch with Wally. Yes. We <laughs> My had, week has so been if crazy. You haven't, uh, if you don't know, if you haven't been involved in the last two, three shows, uh, I do a, I'll be doing it every other week from this point on, but I've been doing a lunch with Wally. Come in, let's chat, watch Wally eat tuna fish sandwiches, bologna. What did I have the first week? I had Oh, I had waffles. waffles. I had waffles. Thank you, Frank. Thanks for throwing redlineshipping.com up. And uh, it's just a fun half hour to 40 minutes to sit back and talk geckos, talk isopods, talk about whatever you want to talk about. But we're going to move it over to every other week because we have so much going on in the next few weeks. What do we have going on? <laughs> I've got is that the schedule? This is two weeks. I'm looking at the schedule right here. Oh my Should goodness. I do this or do yeah, you want to do, do this? this? Okay, it's overwhelming. so this Friday, which is tomorrow, <laughs> we're down in uh, Racine, Kenosha Racine with Bill Stewart, uh, Reptile Rescue video coming out the next week. I'm going to do this quick because I want to get Robin on as soon as possible here. Sunday, we're at the Scaled Up Reptile Expo in Green Bay. This, this is going to be a huge show for us. We're going to fill up three tables worth of merchandise, geckos, isopods, stream isopods, chow, all kinds of good all stuff. Kinds. Uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, we're in Michigan. We're visiting Pangea, and we'll go to Holland and take in the tulips, even though it's not the tulip it's not festival. Tulips now. It's not tulips now. Wednesday night, we have the Crested Gecko Roundtable with, oh my gosh, uh, Brian Butler. Who do we have? I'm uh, uh, Tristan from Gecko Junkie. We have uh, Miss Audra and Will from Flawless Crested Geckos, folks. We're wow. going to talk about just general crested gecko questions. We have about seven or eight uh, questions that we'll ask everybody, and everybody will give their opinion or how they do things. And it's not to compare and say, you're right, you're wrong. This is how Wally does it, how Flawless does it, how uh, Altitude Exotics does it, how Gecko Junkie does it. 
and just get some different ideas for you to take back and you to go, that sounds like a different way of doing it. Maybe I'll do it that way too. So, so that's Wednesday night. Yes. We're coming back from Michigan Wednesday afternoon to do the show Wednesday night. Yeah, it's Wednesday's oh. going to be fun. Wednesday's okay. going to be fun. I hope there's not traffic jams in Chicago. Okay. Thursday night, that Thursday night, we have a rare geckos with Ian Polka from oh, I don't even know the, the business name. I should know this. I'm blanking out. But Ian Polka has been in the hobby for a long, long time and has some super rare geckos. That will be fun. So that's a week from now. Uh, Saturday, we have the Midwest Gecko Fest in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, it's focusing on leopard geckos and other geckos. Uh, that's an all-day event. This is exciting. This is the first one. That should be a blast. Um, great networking, great information, great speakers. Monday, 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 the 28th is the live marathon. We're going to go three, four, five. Five twenty. Frank's going to say 24 hours. We aren't. Ian Polka is in here. Ian, what's your business name? Why am I blanking it's on a this? Secret, um, he I, says. Yeah, yeah, he, he would say that. He wouldn't tell me what his business name is. Now now I'm on his bad list. Um, so money is the live marathon. The 28th. The 28th. We're going to do the buy me a coffee big giveaway. Uh, gargoyles, crusteds, all kinds of other stuff. If you're a buy me a coffee member in that program, we're doing a giveaway for an appreciation for you becoming a member and staying with us for so long. Um, and we're going to introduce a new tool that I've been working with to help me organize because I need organization. And I'm going to talk about that tool on the 28th. I've been doing videos for this last week. I think I've done eight different videos for this new tool. Okay. Story time. Did you have a question? No, I don't. I'm just <laughs> looking at that schedule going, uh oh. I, I hope everybody's wearing a seatbelt. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. The old name is. Uh, story time. We went to Schaumburg and ARBC uh, a couple of weeks ago. And my intent was to pick up some geckos, talk to Joe Hop, talk to a couple of other people. And to find out shipping information, specifically, I wanted to talk about, talk to, oh, who was the company? I can't remember their name. I can't remember. But I wanted to talk, stop by their table. And sure enough, they were on the outside of the room. So we walk right by. And we've got to stop there when we come back through. We've got to stop there. I don't want to stop now. And I just want to get in the show. So show, show, show. And about four hours later, we're walking out. And... I walk up to the table and here Robin is standing there. It's like, oh my gosh, I don't want to bother him. He's so busy all the time. And I think he was sitting playing solitaire at the table. No, no, he was not. He was on the phone. He was it, literally, he was on the phone answering messages. I thought, I'll just get two minutes. Hey, Robin, how are you doing? I want to find out some information about Redline and shipping. But, and, and it just kind of, stuck in there for a second how about coming on the supreme gecko live show and let's talk about shipping and robin wasn't like okay let me think about it let me think of a time i'm really busy i know i know how busy this guy is and hey robin would you come on the supreme gecko robin doesn't know me robin doesn't know supreme gecko and could you would, would you think about doing the show yeah yeah i'll do it Wait, I wasn't prepared for that. Um, now I have to explain a little bit. Now I have to find a date. And so date. Annette and, and Robin are, how does this date? Well, no, I can't do it. How about this date? Yeah, that'll work. So long story short, Robin agreed to come on tonight and talk about redline shipping and shipping reptiles. And it's not just reptiles. It's fish and ice pods. Or if you want to ship live, Robin's going to talk about it. And Robin's going to convince me you? that I should not ship by usps anymore so can i ship him um, can you ship me comment here um, sure the shirt you're wearing is red why does it look orange on our screen um because i changed i slightly tweaked the tones a little bit the color tones because you you know that i like orange so much so if i can tweak like green to make it look orange i'll do that for the show but how about that? The Blackhawk tag goes just perfect with the shirt. Yeah, I, I might just orange. wear this for like two weeks in a kind row. Kind of weird. It's too orange. So I told Robin about four to five minutes. <laughs> now it's 10. So oh, let's that, bring it on. He, poor guy. Robin, this is every single show. I'll just talk for two minutes and 10 minutes later. How are you doing? Here we are. I'm good. How are you guys? 
We're doing great. You sound good. You look good. Um, I, feel I good. love the sign behind you. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. Now, can I just say, Wally, that you drastically undersell yourself. Talking, oh, about, meeting, about, talking about meeting me at Schaumburg, uh, I mean, I'm sure you didn't realize this, but I've been looking forward to meeting Wally Kern for decades now. What did I do? What did I do that you wanted to meet me? And I can picture Homer and Bart like. Gah, gah, gah. No, I mean you're you're. I mean you're literally a gecko legend. Let's let's be real here. And I just we'd never crossed paths, which I thought was weird. It is kind of weird. Um, and so yeah, to to look up from the table and there you are standing there. Um, it was awesome. I was it's really incredible. thrilled that you you stopped by because I've all I really have. I've always wanted to meet you uh, in person. And chat you up, so uh, I appreciate you uh, engaging with me and and uh, making this happen. I couldn't be more thrilled to uh, have some conversation with you at the show, and then uh, to to be here um, on the podcast as well. It's fantastic. It was my thrill entirely at Schaumburg, and it's our honor to have you on our show. A absolutely, Rob. I can't, you know, one hundred percent honesty there. And I appreciate your kind words. I just feel like I'm living the dream and doing what I love to do. And me too. And sharing the passion and it's kind passion. of uh maybe uh, maybe we feel the same but it's kind of surreal like <laughs> we get to do this thing to yes. be in the reptile world uh you know to work with animals um to have this community that we have this family that we have you know it's a, it's it's big business like there's a lot of money being exchanged and it's a, you know it's a hundred million dollar industry but at the same time it's still pretty small you know, and you're able to know all these different players and people in the industry from small breeders up to big breeders. And uh, it's it's just a real privilege to be to be in it. Um, I've kind of bopped around over the past uh, 30 plus years. You know, I've done the live animal stuff. I've done breeding uh, for decades. And then I've done service, which on like the shipping side, I've done informational stuff like reptile report type of stuff. I've done products as well. Um, so my journey has evolved over the years, but yeah, I mean, it's, I don't know. Sometimes it just feels really surreal. Like this is what we do. It's, it, 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 it's kind of wild. It, it is wild. It is kind of wacky in that I find myself downstairs cleaning gecko poop once in a while and thinking, why am I doing, I'm cleaning gecko poop. Is this really what I, and, and it's like within three seconds, it's like, yes, yes, yep. this is exactly what I want to do. And I'm blessed to be able to do it. So I don't. You don't you don't like cleaning gecko poop? Not at all. Not at all. Well, and I yeah, I'm with you. I uh, I'm over the cleaning the poop part. Um, <laughs> I'm I'm good. I'm, I'm I put that part to bed, um, and I put the breeding <laughs> thing to bed to bed. I, I don't have any drive or inclination to uh, breed animals anymore, reproduce stuff. Um, I do get to live vicariously through a lot of fantastic breeders. And I, you know, I get to cheer people on, on, on breeding amazing species, doing great combinations, you know, in the ball python world or whatever it is. Um, so I, I do get a lot of enjoyment out of that. But yeah, at this point in my life, yeah, I'm, I'm good on cleaning poop, and <laughs> scraping urates and, uh, you know, dealing with the regurgitated rat here and there. Yeah, I'm, I'm good on I'm not doing that anymore. Walk into the room and it's like, yep, something's up. Yep. <laughs> It's just the well, of finding it. In in <laughs> decades past, like in the 90s, we did giant snakes. So we did berms and African rocks and retics and stuff, and we fed rabbits. And yeah, wow. once in a while you would get a regurge of a full-size rabbit nope. right on the heat tape. Nope. Oh and my god. I mean, yes, when it, exactly as you said, when you walk in the room, it hits you like a Mack truck, and you're like, well. This is going to be an interesting day, and I smell terrible. Um, and, and I've literally used a snow shovel to scoop. Oh my gosh! You know, because it's you know giant snake, giant rabbit, and it's all you know partially decomposed and slow cooking on the on the heat tape for a few hours. And the, the funny thing is, uh, uh, any number of times, I then take a lunch break and I go to Subway or sandwich shop no. or whatever, get, get in line for a sandwich, and the people around me just look at me like I'm. Uh, some kind of disgusting alien because I must smell just terrible. But, you know, again, hey, that's part of our gig. That's part of our industry, part of the adventure. It, it really <laughs> is. Now, see, I'm working with geckos about this big. So 
for me, it's like, oh, I've got a little, little, hold on just a second. I've got a little poop on me, a little poop on me right there. No, so, no, no shovel needed. No yeah. shovel needed. Uh, not that bad at all. I, I, I <clears throat> can't complain whatsoever. Yeah. Now, I, you, in your intro. Yeah. You've already got me interested in talking about something other than Redline. Uh, number one, your schedule sounds ridiculous, much less my schedule. I mean, yeah, you guys are, are incredibly busy. But the list of people you just ran off that you guys get to see and work with over the next couple of weeks is amazing. Absolutely awesome. So Pangea, you're going to do your Michigan trip to Pangea. Mm-hmm. I go out there every once in a while. Um I kind of there's a Michigan uh, kind of a circuit you can do. Um, I'll I'll visit Bar Check and then I'll go by Josh Frogs and then I'll go by Pangea, and they're all great friends. And you know we I've watched all of them grow their businesses to these absolute monsters. I mean you know uh, Matt at Pangea, Josh at Josh's Frogs. I mean these guys are titans of our industry at this point, and I love their success. I love to see how hard they work and, and what they're able to do. But yeah, that Pangea trip is awesome. I love spending time with Matt, uh, John, uh, Tim, Kevin, all of the guys over there are just great. So that's super awesome. You guys get to go hang out with them. Anytime you can go to Josh's Frogs as well. I don't know if you've ever been there. That's a hell of a trip. uh, So when I'm planning all of this with Pangea and we (laughs) have a little bit of a family trip over there with our granddaughter and I'm scheduling and then the opportunity came up to have this uh, Crush the Gecko Forum, uh, that popped up. And before that, it was like, can we do Josh's Frogs? Can we do this? Can I extend the Pangea triple? And that came up and was like, ah, no, we're going to get home and we're going to do, we'll do this round one. table. Yeah, we'll do a separate one. Yeah, I, I definitely. Couldn't agree, I couldn't agree more with that. Matt, though. Well, Matt, and the Pangea is in Grand Rapids, which is actually a very cool little town. Nice, nice little, you know, college style town, nice culture restaurants, uh, hangout spots, art. It, it's a pretty town. It's very cool. Josh's Frogs is in Owasso. Yes. And I think there's one stoplight <laughs> and buildings from 1920. And there's not much else there besides uh, Josh's uh, Frogs. So there, the, the, that's a big contrast. I, I'm not looking to hang out in Owasso other than going to Josh Frogs. <laughs> um, but that Pangea trip is definitely worthwhile. I, me and Matt go and, and try and find some really great food. He's taking me some really nice spots. And doing? of course they're, you know, he's a great host. Um, but then on top of that, I had to write these down because I was, I was so uh, stoked about it. Brian Butler, Audrin Will from Flawless and Tristan. These are all red line folks. I don't know if you're real. Yes, um, absolutely. but yeah, I mean, awesome guys. Brian Butler's here in, in town, here in Denver with me. So uh, that's I've had right. a relationship that's with right. him for a long time. He's a great guy, sure. amazing breeder. Um, and then Audra and Will, also uh, fantastic breeders. Um, nice younger you know, couple coming up and doing some really awesome stuff. And then, I mean, you want to talk about a future titan of industry. That would be Tristan at Gecko Junkie. Tristan is right there. You know, when I think of Tristan, I think of uh, Matt. Uh, parks from you know 15 years ago maybe not even that long ago and, and I, I want to tell a real quick story with matt i knew matt you know forums and i talked to matt all the time and back about 15 60 17 years ago i was thinking about um doing exactly what matt's doing adding more product to the table and opening maybe a store and then within a year matt's got matt has the store up his online store and doing all those things i was like I'm done. I, I can't I can't keep up with this. Matt's doing it, and I'm not going to jump in the middle of what he's doing. He's it's a really work. super guy. Yeah, yeah but, it's a um, ton of work. Tristan, um, what he's been able to do just in the past few years is it blows me away. Yes. I don't, know, yes. I don't know if I could tell you anybody more motivated, focused, and hardworking than him. I do, I do try and warn him about, you know, uh, burning himself out. I don't know that he's taken a day off in the past three years, but – you know, he does a hundred million shows a year. Um, I mean, just always so focused and so driven. I love it. I always love, I mean, to be honest and square, we are uh, the elder folks of our industry at this point. I love to see these young guys coming up and just being, and you know what? They're, they're executing at a much higher level than I was at their age. 
a thousand percent. You know, when I was in my twenties, I would, we were fumbling around in the dark, bonking into walls, making the dumbest friggin' mistakes possible. And then when I look at Tristan or, or, uh, you know, uh, Will and Audra, these younger folks are, they're executing so well. It's just, it's really impressive. I love to see it. I love to see people be successful. I love to see, you know, great people doing great work. So that's yeah. awesome. I, I'm stoked you guys get to, to hang out with such great folks over the next couple of weeks. And absolutely. And positive attitudes. And yep. just like you were saying, they have a vision. All three of them have a vision. It's cool to see Brian doing other things. And like you say, uh, said about Tristan not burning himself out. Tristan, I, I think, I you know, laser focused, um, just all kinds of things going on in his life. And it's just crazy. But, you know, young guy, all, all of these people are young people and with good direction and good focus and, and good intention. So great yeah. to see that. I'm right there with you. Absolutely. Yeah. And I see uh, Spencer there chiming in as well. Uh, he's also, he's doing some amazing stuff on the gecko side, on the frog side. Um, and he's been killing it as well. There's just, there's so much exciting stuff happening. Um, it, I think it's a really great time for the industry. I think that the sky's the limit, really. It is. And, you know, I think we occasionally see some negative coming across, you know, the sure. Facebook and, and all over the place. But I think the positive just overlays that so much. And yeah. I think that the the negative will bubble up and hopefully people will jump in and, and kind of bring it back down again. Well, I mean, there's always a cycle, right? I mean, we've yeah, been always. around long enough. We've, we've witnessed a bunch of these cycles. So, you know, business is up, then business is down, then it's back up, and then it's back down. This species is hot right now, and then that species is going to be hot in two years. And that's always very difficult to predict, by the way. But, you know, I mean, it's cyclical. But I think if you execute at a very high level and you're consistent and reliable with what you're doing, you are able to ride through those things and, and continue to be successful. You know, you, you can't get frustrated by the the tough stuff and, and uh, you know, look to bail out. You, you have to be, you have to stay the course. That's, that's the key to success over the and long I, term. A hundred percent agree. And I think that in any of these different, uh, you know, snakes or crested geckos or leopard geckos, we're going to see the, the peaks and the valleys. And I think that unfortunately in crested geckos right now, we're seeing, you know, kind of that, that valley happening. Uh, but just like you just said, you have to, to wear it out. Uh, live through it, it's not going to go away, folks. You know, it, it doesn't make any sense to buy into some of these big projects and two years later be be dumping and moving on. It just doesn't make right. any sense. If that's the case, then your focus was wrong two years ago. Yep. Yep. Stay the course. Stay the course. Absolutely. And again, you know, the three that I mentioned, three groups that I mentioned, I think that they have just laser focus and that's so good to, to see. Talking about focus, what focused you on reptiles. Now, I want to talk about reptiles, but I also want to talk about your other ventures that you had in the beginning. I want to kind of get some background on what started you with, with some of these other things that you were doing. Well, I mean, I started on the on the breeding side, you know, working with animals. Um, and that was 1993. And 100% honest, I fell ass backwards into it. I didn't have any background. I didn't know anything about the animals. Um, you know, I, I grew up, uh, actually, I grew up in Hawaii. And so, uh, all you know, through school and high school was all over there. And so we didn't have many reptiles. We did have jacks and chameleons, which oh. were exported out of Hawaii for a long time. But, you know, no exposure to, you know, snakes and cool lizards. Um, certainly not, uh, you know, spiders and tarantulas and things like that. So when I moved to Colorado um, for college, that's where I was exposed to the animals. Um, I met my business partner and he had already had a collection of, you know, a small collection of, of uh, well, a little bit of everything, some snakes, some geckos, lizards. And he said, hey, you want, you know, should we make a business of this? And I thought, sure, that sounds great. Why not? I didn't, I didn't know it was going to turn into a career. Uh, but it, it beat delivering pizzas, which I was doing, and it beat making sandwiches at Subway, which I was doing, and it beat working at the, you know, the CD store, which is an actual retail store that sells music on a physical uh, substrate. 
I, I have to buy something to yeah. take it home and then I have to buy something to play it on. I don't get that. Yeah. It's, it's that? hard to, it's hard to imagine, you know, I, and I was actually looking for whatever dumb reason, I still have like 3000 CDs and they're all in cases. Oh my gosh. And there's nothing you can do with them. You can't I mean, do anything. They're completely useless, but I don't, I have a hard time throwing them away. I suppose I could, you know, put them online and sell them for, you know, 10 bucks per thousand or something. Maybe somebody wants them. But yes, back in the day, we used to have music stores. You would go in to buy uh, cassette tapes and CDs and records and stuff. So, yeah, I was just doing that at the time. And, and I thought the reptile thing was super fascinating. I just had no exposure as a kid. And so, you know, got a crash course in husbandry. And, um, you know, we were working with, uh, on the gecko side, we were working with leopard geckos at the time. Um handful of monitor species, uh, some colubrids, boas, pythons. I don't know if you remember back in the 90s, uh, a lot of us made really dumb choices. We tried to work with everything. Like you just tried to do every species you could possibly do. And it turns out you you, you can do that really poorly. Yes, yes. You know, and, and over time we realized, oh, if you focus on a, a, one species or a handful of species, you can do those at a very high level. But if you're trying to do a, a ton of different things, you're going to be mediocre at all of them. So yes. we spent a lot of years being mediocre. And, uh, of course, the Internet wasn't around at first. So it's also hard to exchange information and breeding, uh, you know, uh, cues and, and swap stories and stuff. It was much more difficult. Um, and so, you, you know, you had to end up learning those hard lessons. But over time, we figured it out. We focused down. I really enjoyed keeping monitor lizards. I really enjoyed keeping... Uh, Asian rat snakes, mandarins, um, cocci, uh, rhino rat snakes are a favorite. Yeah. Um, we certainly did a lot of ball pythons very early on. Um, but I, I mean, I suppose if you, you pin me down today, uh, I probably still favor monitor lizards if I had to choose one particular type of animal. I, I, I like the personality of, of the lizard. I like the more interactivity of it as opposed to a ball python, you know, sits in a tight spot. Um, not super exciting, but you know, the lizards, <laughs> even the geckos, they have more personality, more interactivity. I, I get a lot out of that. So did you, you mentioned, uh, rhino, did you see, I've got to ask you this. Did you see, it was posted on Facebook. I think it was a green rhino. I mean, just uh, blue green, just as vibrant and jello looking, uh, almost see-through. It was just amazing, amazing animal. Somebody posted that, and I don't no. know if I'd seen it before. It was just a crazy, crazy cool animal. I yeah, was. I think the the rhino rats, if we're talking about the same thing, yeah. is, is one of the most visually stunning animals to keep. Like it makes a, a beautiful display animal. You know, regardless of trying to breed it and reproduce it, just to keep it and enjoy it for its behavior and the visible, the visual aspect of it. They're a gorgeous, gorgeous species. I love keeping geckos, but. <clears throat> it's hard, especially doing YouTube, you know, going downstairs in the middle of the day and saying, okay, here's my 20 tanks of Cresta geckos. You can't see them now because they're nocturnal or muscular, right. but um, they're so cool. They're so cool, but you can't see them right now. Sorry. Right. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. Funny how that works. Yes. But do you so, go at night then? Do you ever go at night to, I, to check I in? And, and don't because I do. you do. Um, I don't at night because the very first cool animal that I ever had, and again, this is probably 20 years ago, I was down in the flashlight and, oh my gosh, look how red this thing is. Red as my, or as orange as my shirt, <laughs> as red as my hat. And I had orange. to pull it out and camera and flash, 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 and the tail dropped and it was like, okay, never again. I'm not going to do that anymore. So I have a reluctancy to check them and, and do anything with them. I'll kind of do the red light and kind of take a look at them a little bit, but not much past that. Or crested geckos, I mean, I remember back in the day, the tail drops so sensitive. I mean, do you have crested geckos there that uh, will drop their tail if somebody sneezes in San Diego? Not not so much. Um, okay. I think it's mine, really and everybody has a, we've lost <clears throat> a couple. I mean, of many. probably 100 adult crested geckos. We don't have that many without no. tails. Okay. Um, That's good. I think it's just a matter of, oh, we just lost our lights. Oh, it's a matter of <clears throat> just... Timer. Yeah, it's a matter of the timer going off. It's a matter of just um, 
uh, doing the wrong things, like surprising them. Just like That's think cool. of me at you know three o'clock in the morning and turning on the lights and saying, "Get up! We're running a three mile marathon." I'm I'm doing anything I can to get away from that situation. Okay. And you're, uh, you're gonna yeah, drop your tail. I'm gonna drop my tail. <laughs> I'm gonna bite you. I'm gonna do anything. Yeah. So that's kind of crust the geckos ish. Got it. Tell us about your other ventures, though. I mean, you've been you've had your hands in a lot of stuff. Tell us yeah. about. Tell us. I know two big ones. Well, so the breeding with the animals uh, that lasted through two, 2011, so 93 to 2011. And that uh, got, you know, shut off for us in a very sudden fashion. Or we had a fire. Um, so that, you know, changed, changed the world for us. Um, and pr just prior to that, in 2009, uh, had the idea for, you know, doing this third-party shipping service. And so uh, started uh, Shipping Reptiles in 2009. And that took off pretty quick. Um, uh, Funnily enough, I mean, it was a brand new model. So you, there was some education and, and trying to convert people into, you know, using it as a service. But it still started very well. Um, funny thing is Redline, I started last year, uh, just about a year ago now. It started even faster than SYR did back in the day. But um, for a new business, new concept in 2009, I mean, we hit the ground running. And it was, uh, it was off to the races and, and just, you know, kept going up, up and up from there. Um, 2011, we, we ended with our live breeding and, uh, then 2012, you know, it came time where the live breeding stopped because of this traumatic event. And so, you know, you got to figure out what do we do now? Where do we go? What's, which is the way forward? We do have this ship your reptiles thing. It's going really, really well, but there's, there's room to do other things. And so I had this uh, concept idea for the reptile report that I'd been kicking around for a while, kind of an aggregation of, you know, news and information, videos, well, not video at the time, photos and, and stuff all into one feed. Um, and so uh, I got to work on that. So we launched reptile report in 2012. Um, and that is still going today. I still have that. Um, and I have a couple of awesome staffers that helped me. Uh, do that. And it's on Facebook and Instagram. On Facebook, it's over a million followers now. So we have a nice, wow, nice size audience. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a really, I mean, now it's, there's no more um, breeding articles. There's no more husbandry discussion on there. It's just, you know, you got to go with the time. So it's just pictures and videos, just cool animals. Um, back in the day when we started 2012, as you will remember, you know, forums used to be such a big deal in our world. You know, there used to be gecko oh. forums and ball python forums and lizard forums and and uh, there were husbandry forums and breeding forums. And so the, we included that kind of content in the reptile report. And so there was more in-depth discussion that we were featuring. But, you know, Facebook really essentially killed off all the forums and those all, you know, withered away on the vine. And Facebook also, uh, to our detriment, I think, also killed our attention span. And so everything is now very short, uh, shallow content at this point on these social media uh, sites. And so, yeah, the, you know, like I said, the Reptile Report just kind of evolved with it until it's just a stream of really excellent uh, photos and uh, videos. And, you know, it is what it is. Um, there's, you know, has a ton of followers and people that really love it. So the, I, I'm glad that uh, we still have that going. That's over 10 years now. Um, 2014, I think it was, we started a heat tape company to do uh, heat tape with THG. And we started manufacturing our own heat tape to compete with the FlexWatt product out there at the time. Um, when I then, uh, when I launched Redline Science Company, my product company under Redline, in 2019, I rolled heat tape under under Redline. So now the, the heat tape is Redline branded. Um, and then I had a, another, you know, life shift in 2019. I split with my business partner. We kind of had a business divorce. And, um, you know, he kept the couch. I kept the dishes. You know, <laughs> you, you split things up. I kept the reptile report. He kept ship your reptiles. And, uh, again, it's another pivot point to say, what now? What do you do moving forward? Do I want to do something completely different? 
And immediately my thought was, no, I want to be in the reptile world. I, I really love being in the reptile world. I have a lot of passion about uh, reptile business and the reptile industry. And I have a ton of contacts and friends and, and relationships that I right. you know, had for the past 25 years. So um, I, I uh, put together a, a great partnership team. We created Redline Science. We do a number of products, uh, cleaning scrapers for cleaning poop. Um, we do that and stainless and, and different things like that. And then um, last year, the time was right to uh, go back into shipping. And I have a very, very strong passion uh, for shipping. I really enjoy that aspect of our business. I really enjoy being able to help uh, people ship uh, safely and uh, responsibly and successfully. Uh, we help a ton of breeders ship their animals. Absolutely. But we also help the mom shipping uh, a single snake to college for yes. their kid. We help the families that are relocating across the country with their leopard geckos or their corn snakes or their ball pythons. You know, they're, they're only going to ship once, but that's fine. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. that it's, if you don't ship a lot or if you've never shipped a live animal before, it seems very, very daunting, right? It sounds yes. like a little bit crazy, but it's actually a really straightforward and simple process. So to be able to give people the confidence uh, to do that uh, and, and feel safe and comfortable like i'm gonna i've had this bearded dragon for 15 years now i need to move from california to michigan how am i going to accomplish that and we can you know provide them the packaging and the information and the support they need to do that safely and successfully and when you get that call on the other end of that shipment and mom calls and she says the bearded dragon arrived it's it came in perfect shape i can't believe it got here you know overnight and I'm so happy. Thank you so much. I'm so relieved. That's there's a lot of uh, satisfaction in that. So yes, um, that's one of the best experiences we have. Yes, I love helping Will and Audra ship ball pythons and geckos. Fantastic. I love helping Brian ship his geckos. Fantastic. But I really love helping mom uh, ship her pet. I mean, that's it's just a, a really deep satisfaction there to, to be able to help people do that and uh, feel good about it. You know. It, it makes up for, I'm going to speak for you for just a second. It makes up for a lot of, um, hey, my gecko isn't eating. What should I do? Uh, well, give me some more information. And to have that one person, you know, even if it's once a month, come back and say, hey, I bought a gecko from you. Um, I just wanted to say our daughter, it's helped our daughter feel more comfortable with reptiles. It's like, yep. I'm a winner. I, I, I just won. Isn't that awesome? It is. Mm -hmm. it, it, nothing beats that. For me, that, that, well, finding a new baby gecko that I've never bred before maybe beats it a little bit, but yeah. it, that's a really close second. And, you know, I don't, I don't know that we talk about that often, you know, those, those little small but really important victories. Um, you know, you're right. When I would help somebody with, uh, you know, buying a monitor lizard and, and setting it up for the first time and having that really great experience, um, to be making the right species choice and to be making the right caging choice and to be able to raise it up. And I hear from them six or seven years later and I see pictures of the, of the older animal now it's, it's thriving and doing great. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a fantastic part of our business that, yeah, actually, you know, now that I think about it, we don't discuss a whole lot. But, yeah, it's really it's really a great uh, piece of feedback to receive. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And in your line of business, I would have to think you don't get a whole lot of that. I would think that maybe 60% of your questions are, I've never done this before. How do I even do it? And then the 39%, yeah, 39% is, hey, I did this, but I'm not sure about this. And, and or I have a specific question. And then that 1% is, uh, hey, you made my, our day and, and helped us with this. Thank you very much. Yep. Um, we, pro we probably hear that back that the you know thanks so much it's been a fantastic experience uh once a week that's great i mean for a yeah, service business i mean for geckos live animals i feel like we have more of an opportunity to hear some good feedback like that from a service um uh, a business like yours i i would think that it would be more like uh, I assume that it's going to work. You told me it's going to work. You told me it's going to work. I'm just going to assume that it's going to work. And anything that goes wrong, Robin, you told me that it, I'm 
people are sometimes well, like you, that, but sometimes not. I mean, we I can't kid you. We have our battles as well. Sure. Um, I'm sure that you work hard to educate your buyer on proper husbandry and care and don't swing your crested gecko over your head by its tail. Woo! And yet they'll still do these things. Number one, we've I've definitely learned over the years, people don't read. So you try and provide as much information as you possibly can and support, and people will gloss right over it and, and skip through it. And unfortunately, then uh, they'll make a mistake or a bad choice. And uh, that's a bit frustrating um, because number one, we're working with live animals. So if you make a bad choice, uh, sometimes it's, it's a very negative result. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so th that's the that's definitely the worst side of the business. Um, you know, I I get really frustrated and, I'll, you know, we'll pull the curtain back a little bit. <laughs> but I get really frustrated when it's 85 degrees out and somebody ships a gecko or a baby snake and they put a heat back. You know, because that ends up with a dead animal. Mm -hmm. And that's completely avoidable, completely and, and avoidable. That's simple and, enough. Yeah, that that bums me out every single time. And it doesn't happen often, but it does happen. Right, right, right. Um, and, and, and and the other but the thing is, see, nobody ever does that maliciously. Nobody no, ever kills no. their animal and says, I'm about to kill this. Absolutely. No, they mean the best. They have the best right. intentions. Yes. Absolutely. Think, well, it's a reptile, they like it hot. Yep. So I'm gonna put this heat pack in. Yes. Better or safe gonna... than sorry. Better safe than sorry. Let's put the heat right. pack on and <laughs> Because they like it hot, right? Now. Or I'm going to put three heat packs in. Like you know, you yes, that's my face. It's a cringe that you're just like, oh. There's a note on the site that talks about heat pack use, and it says it hammers again and again. When to use heat packs and when not to. And I yes. I've said it a million times, and I'll say it again. Uh, DOAs are uh, a fraction of one percent of shipments. A fraction of one percent. And of wow. all of those DOAs, 95% of the DOAs are user error. And most of that is heat pack use. Wow. That's what wow. it is. You know, Since FedEx, FedEx can delay a package. FedEx delays packages every single day. But if you package it correctly yep. and you follow our temperature guidelines, it's an inconvenience. It's not arriving the day it's supposed to be. But if, if you follow packaging, you follow temperature guidelines, <clears> the animal's <throat> still going to be fine. You know, it'll still arrive fine. Right. But when you misuse a heat pack, when you use a heat pack when it's already too warm, there's just, it's very little uh, hope that the animal at 85 degrees plus a heat pack, there's not a species that's going to survive 24 hours in that condition. And boy, that bums me out. And we try and explain. The reptiles are much more friendly with cool temperatures than they are with hot temperatures. Yes. You know, yes. If it went down to 50 degrees for three days straight, you'd still have a, a live animal. If it goes yeah. up for 95 degrees for four hours straight, you probably have a dead animal. Yeah. You know, it's just the heat is your, your biggest killer. I'd much rather ship in the winter than I would in the summer. Every, every single time. I say it all the time. I, I say so that much all the time. So much um, easier. You, you brought up some statistics, and I'm mm -hmm. going to jump back for a second. And we right. talked. To, you talked about um, you know, the, the biggest error, the biggest thing going wrong with a, a shipping is uh, user error. And most often it's something to do with heat. Let's go all the way back. Um, if I could find it, I would. But JP mentioned, I'm here it scared. is. I'm scared of shipping reptiles and don't even know why, even though I have received a few that were shipped. Yep. Let's talk to that person. Let's right now, you and I, let's talk to that person that has never shipped an animal and let's get over their fears of shipping. What are some of the things? What are, what are some of the things that they should be do, doing? And you know, it goes hand in hand. What are some of the things? You know, obviously, uh, other than shipping no in pack. eighty-five degrees and and adding a heat pack, what are some of the things that they shouldn't be doing? Let's help that person that's just now starting shipping animals. So it, as I mentioned, it seems daunting, right? JP is intimidated by the idea of shipping a live animal. Yes. Mm -hmm. But the nature of what we do, you can ship reptiles and you can ship aquatics and you yes. can ship inverts. Yep. Mm -hmm. And you can ship these things because you can ship them. 
you can't ship dogs and cats. You can't ship puppies and kitties. You can't ship a rabbit in a FedEx box overnight. We it's found the, that you can't ship your kids. <laughs> you can't ship your kids. You can't. Or husband. Yeah. Is, 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 I can make custom boxes. I can make a big <laughs> enough insulated box that Wally you could fit in. Okay. But it's, it's not going to be a guy. Rabbit talk. <laughs> but, you know, the, the reptiles and aquatics and inverts, because of their nature, it we can ship them overnight and be very safe and successful about it. They're not they're not warm blooded animals, right? So the the reptiles um, do very well with overnight shipping. And let's be clear, overnight shipping is required through FedEx. You you're not allowed to ship reptiles two days or three days or slower uh, services through FedEx. It has to be overnight. So there's there's four basic steps. Uh, uh, JP for it. Number one, get the proper packaging. You can't just wing it. No, you can't just grab your Amazon box that they just sent you a pack of batteries in and put an animal in and send it out. That's not how it works. So it requires an insulated box. It requires a, a container for your animal, deli cup or, or reptile bag, depending on what species it is. Um, during the winter, it may require a heat pack, according to the guidelines. During the summer, it definitely doesn't require a heat pack, but maybe it uses a phase pack or a cold pack. So um, to make it easier, we sell a shipping kit, and it comes with everything you need to ship an animal one time, whether it's winter or summer. So if JP orders just one shipping kit, that's going to have, it's going to have a deli cup, it's going to have a bag, it has the insulated box. So you've got step one, get your packaging. The next step would be um, to uh, book your label. You come to our website, you book your overnight label uh, with FedEx, um, and then you print out the label right there. And we give a very handsome discount for the label itself. And that's part of the, the benefit of using our services. You don't pay the full retail with FedEx. So you get a nice discount. And we have a bunch of coupon codes, stuff you can use. Um, so get your packaging, you book your label, then you package your animal. And we're happy to walk you through that. We want you to be successful, JP. So um, if you're doing a baby gecko, I'm going to advise you to do it in a deli cup or a container as opposed to a bag. If you're doing a baby ball python, well, you could do it in a deli cup, but snakes are very bag friendly. Same with monitor lizards, very bag friendly. But more delicate species, maybe we want to use a deli cup. But in the kit, you have the choice of either one. So you package up your animal. So we've got packaging. We've booked our label. We've actually packaged the animal. The only thing left is to put the animal in the system. And you can, uh, technically, you can put the animal in the system Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday for delivery the following day. We recommend Tuesday or Wednesday. Um, so that if there is an issue and the package is delayed, it will arrive the following day. It doesn't get stuck over for the weekend anywhere. Um, and we typically prefer Tuesday and Wednesday so that we're able to look at Monday's volume and see how nutty is the system? What does Memphis look like Monday night? Is it crazy? Is it backed up? What does the Indianapolis hub look like Monday night? If it's if it's been stormy and there's, you know, 20 percent of shipments are are backed up and delayed, then we can then advise people not to ship today. System's a little too wacky or the weather's not good or whatever it is. So we advise usually Tuesday or Wednesday is the, is the best choice on, on shipping out. And then on the site, we also have our temperature guidelines for winter and summer. Yes. So we have guidelines that say, we go by daytime highs. So we'll tell you when it's too hot to ship and when it's too cold to ship. And, there's, and I wrote the guidelines back in 2009 and I was very conservative with them. So if you ship in those guidelines, I'm very, very confident if you're using the right packaging, you're going to have success. I love every single one of those points. And we had somebody <clears throat> say contact uh, third party. I yep. was, I will say this. I, I don't know if you can find it now and then at that comment about contacting a third party. But I will say also contact somebody that's shipped before. I mean, sure. My gosh, contact me if you want to, um, and I'll walk you through the whole process. We actually have videos. I think we have two videos, one on isopods and one just general shipping. 
going through the whole process, but contact yeah. me and I'll, I'll walk you through, especially how to prepare a box, especially how to prepare a gecko. We have a couple of little tricks. We wet the paper towel more in the summer to keep it a little cooler and less in the wind. Just no little food. teeny tiny things, like no food for the, you know, a day before, little yep. things like that. But the four points that you made are just fantastic. I yeah, have that's to relate. We spend, we spend a lot of time walking people through all right. those steps and then all the sub steps of those. Uh, because again, we want people to be successful. The, yes. the worst possible experience is somebody does their first shipment. Uh, there's some crucial mistake and you have a bad result. I, I absolutely hate people having a negative experience on the, on the first time. It's, it's, uh, it's just so unpleasant. I want to make sure people are successful, give everybody a best chance of success. Absolutely. I, I'm going to ask you what are some of the common um, things that people do in just a second, but I, I but you address this. Okay, I'm going to come back to this okay. then in just a second. Um, do you rem remember our discussion? Do you you know Ryan McVeigh? I do. Yeah, and Erica McVeigh. We had them on a couple of weeks ago. We were talking about shipping animals and and uh, we were talking about receiving animals. And Ryan, oh. go ahead. Go ahead. You know this one. What did he receive? Some they, monitors? They received monitors, small monitors and tube socks. <laughs> uh, if I'm not no. mistaken, and old I might be wrong. I might be. Yeah. Ryan old. said that they were old. If I'm not mistaken, Ryan said that in the past yeah. he's received animals in underwear. In underwear. Just weird packages. Sorry, I mean, it's, I, it's that's funny that, that that happens in 2023. I remember that was pretty common in the 90s. Right, right. People, I mean, people would, I mean, sometimes you would see used socks, yes. But, I mean, I would see people recommend, you know, go to Target or go to Walmart, buy a pack of athletic, you know, uh, uh, knee-high socks, and there's your snake bags. And um, everybody was doing it. You know, I technically, I guess that's correct. It is a bag in the end. But for me... You know, as a, as a reptile breeder, and I think you, I, I'm betting you're going to be the same. The presentation is important to me. Who am I? Am I going to be a professional about what I'm presenting, about taking pride in the animal that I've bred and I've sold and I'm going to send to you? That the packaging has to reflect that. Like, I want, I want everything to be fantastic about this experience. I don't want to uh, you to unwrap an absolutely gorgeous animal out of a dirty pair of underwear. That's not the experience I'm looking for. I think that a comment that you made earlier about today is a different world. You know, 20 years ago, it was on a forum that maybe a lot of people looked at, maybe a lot of people didn't look at, but now it's a TikTok yell. Hey, yeah. got some monitors and they were wrapped in this guy's dirty underwear. And now as a business, your reputation is shot. Yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 it's very difficult to recover from that kind of impression. You, you, you want to think like, you know, who do you want to be? You, you want to be a, a, a great boutique breeder that presents, a, you know, excellence or, you know, you want to be about bullshit. That's not, exactly. I don't want to, I don't want to represent uh, garbage. Like I want people yes. to, again, I take a lot of pride in, in execution. So I want people to be excited about interacting with me or my company or my animals. And I want them to be uh, excited about receiving my animals. I don't want to lessen that experience in any way. I think that's important, how you present yourself. Mm -hmm. and, and go back to, if you go back to the people we talked about earlier, Will and Audra, or Brian Butler, or Tristan, I mean, you, you just have to go look at Tristan's setup at the trade shows. You know that he is obsessed about presentation. Yes. Mm -hmm. He is obsessed about execution. That means the world to him. Yes. And that, that's reflected in everything he does. And that's why I'm excited about him as a person, as a business person, as the future of our industry. Because I can look at him and be like, that's excellence right there. Absolutely. Yeah. Nanette, did you have a question that you wanted to throw on? Yeah, I wanted the, there. JP made a comment that he said the good thing he saved his shipping boxes. You have to be careful with that, though. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Elaborate on that. Um, it's a, so technically, you know, we we all ship under, uh, well, not we all, but, you know, the FedEx shippers here. Yeah. 
we ship under the, the rules and guidelines of FedEx. And technically, the requirement is a new box you're supposed to use, not a used box. And that's not strongly enforced necessarily, but it's a, it's a smart play because there are some dangers of reusing a box. Um, if the box has been compromised or damaged or anything, that could be an issue. Uh, if the styrofoam and the you know foam insulation is is cracked or broken or damaged, that can be an issue. But you know what you see most often when you re reuse boxes is there's an old label on the box, and that old label ends up getting scanned somewhere. And so instead of your package going to North Carolina, it ends up going to Oregon instead. Mm -hmm. Because people, yes. you know, I, I don't know. They just, they, they, they get their new label and they slap it on the box. They're like, all right, here we go. And on the side of the box is an old Amazon label or it's an mm -hmm. old uh, FedEx label. Again, that's going to somewhere completely different. And, you know, the computers and the scanners, they catch it. And it might not end up in Oregon. It might not. It that's, might not. That's probably unusual. But it's going to get delayed, period. And that's the problem. So, yeah, you got to be really careful with uh, used boxes um, it's a bit of a trap. Um, and, you know, again, it's, it's um, about the execution and about the value you want to put in the animals. Um, I think it's worth, I think our animals are worth investing in a case of new boxes. Yes. You know, it's, yes. it's really not that big of an expense. Um, I have reused boxes myself, a thousand percent. Yep. Mm -hmm. But I'm very, very anal and conscientious about mm -hmm. the type of box that I'm willing right. to do that with. And again, it's about presentation. If the box is torn or it's got a, uh, a extra holes or a puncture or something weird, I'm not going to use that box. Um, so, I, you know, I'll, I'll help people figure it out um, if they don't have one of our boxes on hand. There are ways to, you know, you could still execute. Technically, um, the packaging that we sell is, is certified by FedEx, by their packaging lab. I actually have to submit the boxes to FedEx, to the packaging lab. They put it through testing. They put it through strength testing. They drop it off of things. They smash it with stuff. And it has to withstand these, these tests. Um, and that's the, you know, our white box with, with green lettering and, and green graphics on it. But I've also submitted a plain brown box for testing and got that approved as well. So... In a pinch, if JP doesn't have one of my red line boxes on hand, but he still needs to ship this coming week, I can still we can still walk through the process of, you know, going to um, Office Depot or Staples and getting a box, and then going to Home Depot and getting some foam insulation and cutting it to fit. We can still execute at a very nice level, make a very handsome looking box. Um, it's going to cost a lot more than just ordering a box from me. <laughs> Um, but sometimes you're in a pinch and, and it can be done, but the, the simplest thing is, you know, if you're, if you're, uh, uh you want to breed some geckos or you want to breed some corn snakes or whatever it is, uh, and you're going to sell them. Part of that process is get your packaging in advance, get your stuff together, get your things together and understand how you're going to execute it so that it's, um, it's not Wednesday and you want to ship on Thursday. You're, you're thinking about, yes. you know, I'm going to ship this fall. So I'm going to go ahead and order some boxes. I'm going to order some heat packs for the winter. I'm going to order snake bags or deli cups or whatever it might be. You know, just prepare in advance. Perfect. Perfect answer. Let's talk about some of the, and, and I don't know if we've talked about the positive. Here's what you need to do. And that's just contrary to the negative. Uh, here are some mistakes that you can make. But uh, can you think of any other typical mistakes um, new breeders, new shippers would make with their first few shipments or even experienced shippers? Uh, oh, Wally. You're going to make me, <laughs> you're going to make me go over this, uh, horrible negative incident we had this past week. Ruh -ruh. But it's fine. It's educational. Somebody raised up an, a nice leopard gecko as to an adult and they sold it. And they're going to ship it out. And they shipped it with us. And it was their first shipment. And the gecko shipped. The weather was fine. The package, the box was fine. It arrived on time. Fantastic job. Way to go, FedEx. And the gecko's dead. 
Oh no. Adult leopard gecko dead. Wasn't a heat pack. And you're gonna cringe when you hear what it was. Oh no. Adult leopard gecko in a deli cup oh. with no holes. Yep. I oh. Before you even said deli cup, when you said you're going to cringe, immediately my mind went right there. Mm -hmm. And I know a, a big time breeder that has made that made that mistake years and years and years ago. And after sending out and then looking at his deli cups, realized there were no. And that's something that, to be very honest, could just be missed because you go through that routine yep. of ordering, 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 just ship put. And you get a bad shipment like that. And it's like, oh, crap, look at this. Um, I can't even imagine. I can't it's imagine. It's just, you know, again, it's such an avoidable loss, right? Yes. But to your point, like, you, you're assuming all these deli cups got holes. But that's a very, it's not common. I can't remember the last no. time we had a suffocated animal. No. But the, the, the innate fear I have of unpunched delis is very common. Yes. You know? And when we had our animal facility... Um, you know, you have deli cups with no holes that we use for water bowls. And then we have deli cups with holes that we use for shipping. But if you if you don't want to get the wrath of Robin, do not mix those two supplies. Those things don't, they don't interchange. No. Mm -mm. Don't use my punch delis for water bowls. Don't let my water bowls come anywhere near my shipping delis. Because I'm absolutely paranoid of that happening. And when you're pulling delis and cupping animals up and, and doing it and banging it out, those little tiny holes can be easy to miss. Yes, so, yes. yes I, I, I have a hatred for deli cups with no holes myself. I really do. Because of that paranoia. And I'm, I'm not sure you know which breeder you're discussing, but uh, Brian Butler had that issue um, years ago. And he lost a bunch of adult animals because... He pulled delis that were supposed to be punched and they were not. And he cupped a bunch of animals up and they all died. So simple things like that are, are uh, uh, mistakes that happen. And, and you know, like I said, you, you just brought it up. This incident really, literally just happened. And it breaks my heart because, again, this, the shipper did not do that maliciously. No, I had no clue. Right. right. Yeah. It was just an honest mistake. And I don't know where the deli cup came from. I mean, maybe it, you know, maybe he got it, he got olives from the grocery store in it or something. I don't know. And so he's like, hey, it's a deli cup. I'm going to use it. And he forgot to punch it. I don't know. Or maybe it came out of his water bowl supply. Maybe it came out of a, a sleeve where the, the punch was missed. I don't know. But boy, that, that one bummed me out. That, was, that one ruined my week because uh, you hate to see that. So um, you, you see, that sometimes very rarely you see that more often you see uh snake bags that aren't tied right so when the the box opens up there's a loose snake running around oh. or a loose <laughs> lizard running around that's very common um the other thing is and i'd be interested in getting your feedback on this is we um uh require uh ventilation holes in our boxes four holes four one quarter inch holes about the size of a phillips screwdriver yep. two holes on opposite sides of the box. That's four total. I'm going to say it again. Four holes. Four. Four of them. Not six. Not eight. Not one. Four. That's it. I reiterate that again and again and again on the site. And then you'll see somebody ship out a box. I've literally seen 38 holes. <laughs> Outstanding. Yeah. So um, that, and, and again, it's well-intentioned. But that's, you know, that's a mistake that, you know, I wish people would uh, follow the guidelines more specifically. Um, so you see that kind of thing where people uh, overventilate the box, which I think starts to compromise our thermal protection. Uh, it, yeah. it can compromise heat pack function or cold pack function. Um, when you say, Robin, when you say yeah. ventilate it's the four holes, that's going through your styrofoam or your insulation. Yep. Yeah, so yeah. people understand it goes all the way through and you yep. punch that before you put anything in the box. Yes. Yep. Yep. You pre-punch it before you put yep. anything in the box. Well, you, I'm just saying. So I can just see you, you never know. Geckos in the I'm box and you're just it. jabbing 36, 37, 
38. 38. 38 was a record. I mean, there was a lot. I, do that. I, I see, you know, I That's see 10 or 12 awesome. more frequently. But, yeah. um, but and at the same time, you know, I know very successful large breeders that don't put any holes. So, so I, I know it can be done. But, you know, our service, you know, with Redline Shipping, I have to give everybody best chance of success. Yeah. And so my temperature guidelines have to be conservative. My cutoff for the daytime high is 38 degrees for, for a, you know, on the cold side. Myself as a breeder, I've shipped at 10 degrees. Yep. A hundred percent. But I've also shipped, you know, tens of thousands of boxes myself. And I understand the, the uh, complexity of, of a challenge of extreme cold shipping. So I might, uh, well, in that temperature, I double up my insulation and I understand how the heat pack works uh, really well. And I understand the risks involved and, and I'm willing to put my uh, experience and reputation on the line when I'm shipping out my animal. But for my, for my service red line, my, my uh, um, temperature guidelines are much more conservative. Because I need everybody to have success. Yes. And same with the boxes. Yes, you can ship without holes. I've seen it done literally hundreds of thousands of times through friends and, and other uh, uh, bigger breeders. But I think our four holes give you the best chance of success when you're using uh, no heat pack, when you're using a heat pack. You know, the heat pack consumes oxygen. That's how it works. Yeah. And so if you seal the box up too tightly, I think it can compromise the, the effectiveness and use of the heat pack during the winter months. So I, I, I still stand behind the four ventilation holes. Um, oh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have a duel to the death over that. But again, it's the guidelines I set are so that everybody has best yep. chance of success. The yep. first time shipper and the, the person that's shipping their 10,000th package. If you ship it with my guidelines, I expect you're going to be very successful. I try to keep an open mind without anything that we do. And, and, and when I hear somebody say, and I, I actually enjoy, enjoy conversations like this where maybe I'm doing something and mm -hmm. it's completely the opposite of somebody else. I love creative conflict like this. And I think it brings out you make me defend myself on why I'm doing something a certain way. And that's a really, really good thing. Um, so I take challenges like that, you know, to heart, and if I can't, you know, defend myself or defend why, why I'm doing something, then maybe I should stop doing it or think about doing it a different way. The holes thing is a small issue with us. We do not put holes. And folks, don't listen to Wally Kern. That's not my job. My job is not managing a shipping company. So listen to Robin. The only thing that's stopping me today from putting holes in the boxes is just from my experience with shipping and not having issues with um, not putting holes in. So um, it, it's hard for me to go back past that without having some other you know, data. So I guess this leads me to a question about temperature control and understanding you know, what's going on in the box from Wally Kern to you know, Karen who lives in Chicago or you who lives in Colorado. Have you guys ever done tests? You're talking about, you know, FedEx requiring uh, certain uh, things and doing tests and everything. Have you ever done any testing with heat or any other um, environmental things within the box once it's shipped out and seeing that temperature, you know, decrease or increase, you know, with heat packs and what the impact is within the shipping box over a, you know, one day, two day, three day kind of period? Yeah, we've done we've done a bunch of different testing over the years, over the last um, let's see, say, gosh, it's been almost fifteen years um, of of you know since ship your reptiles. I also did some tests back in my pro exotics days, you know, breeding animals, just to try because you're just trying to figure it out for yourself, you know, right? What works best? Um, we've used uh, temperature loggers um, and shipped those out, and then you know, like a modern day temperature logger where you would then, uh, you know, plug it into your computer and see uh, actual graphs and results. And I've also done, you know, very rudimentary tests where I use like a min-max thermometer um, and put the probe inside the box. And I'd, I'd leave it on my porch in the middle of winter um, and leave it outside. And just to see, 
you know, if it's outside at, at 20 degrees for six hours, what do we have? And where are we at? Um, and in that case, I would use a heat pack and I use my four holes. Um, and I, we get very favorable results with the, the guidelines that we provide. You know, when it was, you know, 20 degrees, 25 degrees at night um, with the heat pack in it, like a 1296, very common size box. Um, I mean, we would see internal temperatures would dip below 60 degrees. And again, that that cool temperature is much more favorable than the hot temperature. Yeah, there's not a there's not a reptile on the planet I wouldn't be comfortable shipping at a at a, a ambient temperature of sixty degrees. It's not necessarily ideal, but every species is going to be fine at that temperature. They're not going to overheat and they're not going to freeze. So I, I'm good if I can see 60, 65 degrees in my box. I'd be real satisfied with that. And um, we are able to see that given the insulation we use. I, we use three-quarter inch insulation. There are packaging okay. companies that sell half inch insulation. Um, I think Triple L uses half inch insulation. And Triple L uses no holes. And they send out probably 50,000 boxes a year. And they have very good success with shipping. So, wow. you know, that's fantastic. But again, what, what do I think is going to be most successful and best chance of success uh, is the three quarter inch insulation, which is required by FedEx, and then mm -hmm. holds and our temperature guidelines, heat pack use guidelines. But here's the other thing, Wally, that I have to consider. On our website, you can insure your reptile package for live arrival of $20,000. And so if you have a crested gecko, or say you have a leopard gecko, that you buy for $20. If you want to ship it, you can insure it for $20,000. I don't tie it to market value because I understand that, pet, that these animals have breeder value, reproduction value, and some of them just have straight up pet value. Just because you can buy a, a bearded dragon for 25 bucks doesn't mean that it's not worth $3,000 to somebody that's raised it for 15 years, you know? Yep. So you can insure the animals for up to $20,000 for live arrival on our site but if you do that you have to meet my guidelines where i'm comfortable to know that you're going to be successful so if you want to do your own thing okay i can't stop you but i'm not going to be liable for it anymore you know if you want me to be responsible and say this is the parameters that this is going to work at and then me be financially responsible for that result then these are the these these are the guidelines we're going to use. Like I said, they're very conservative, but it gives me a lot of confidence that you're going to have success. Even if FedEx messes up and delays the package a day or even two days on very rare occasions, I still, if you've done it correctly, I still have very high confidence that the animal is going to arrive safe and sound. It's going to be super inconvenient. Yeah, somebody probably took off uh, work to receive the animal on a Wednesday. Now it's arriving on Thursday. They're back at work. So that sucks. Or it's coming on Friday. And so, you know, not everybody can just take off for the whole week and hopefully, you know, the package arrives. So it's very inconvenient. But for the safety of the animal, if you follow the guidelines, I feel confident about it. And that's what's most important for me. Do you recommend that people have them held at FedEx for pickup? Um, I do. And that's, that's, a, that's way more common. When I when I split with SYR in 2019, um, plenty of folks shipped to hold at the hub. Mm -hmm. In 2023, uh, the majority of people ship to hold at the hub at this point. Mm -hmm. It's it's the predominant choice. And it's a smart choice because if you hold it at the hub, the package arrives first thing in the morning. I mean, it arrives in the wee hours of the morning and it sits inside that facility and it's going to be available at 9 a.m. when they open up. And you can go get it there, you know, first thing in the morning mm -hmm. at your convenience. It never goes out on the driver's truck to travel around town as it works its way to your house. Um, you know, some people that live in rural areas, the delivery time isn't guaranteed mm -hmm. till 430 in the afternoon. Right. Yep. So it, it drives around on a truck yep. all afternoon. And if it's super cold or super hot, that could be an issue. Yep. So, yeah, picking it up at the hub is, is a very, very common thing now. Mm -hmm. Um and so we, we make that process of selecting a hub address uh, very simple on the site. It, all, it populates the hub addresses up automatically, yep. and you can choose which one you want. It tells you how many miles it is from your particular zip code and, 
And so you can, you know, make an easy, quick choice about what the, the closest hub is because not all FedEx facilities will uh, receive live animals. Exactly. It'll allow you to pick it up. So it's important you choose the right one. But we mm -hmm. filter out all the bad ones. We only give you the ones that will do that. But I, I'm a fan of, of hub uh, pickup, but I'm also very confident about the service. And so we, I'll ensure that $20,000 package going to your residence, uh, 100%. I'll, I'll still cover it going residential. I don't have, wow. I don't have any fear of that. I, FedEx really does an amazing job for us. They do a fantastic uh, job, all things considered. I mean, you guys are in uh, Wisconsin, correct? Yep. Yeah. I'm in South Denver. And if, I, if we stop this interview right now, I can run down to the FedEx hub. I can put an overnight package in the system 30 minutes from now, and you'll have it tomorrow morning before 1030. That's that's actually ridiculous. Yeah, that's Amazon that fast. Yeah, I mean, it just, <laughs> the logistics of it make no sense whatsoever. No, no. And because I'm, I'm a total shipping nerd, when I go and travel and I'm out in the middle of North Carolina or I'm out in the middle of the Utah desert and I come across some little gas station or convenience <laughs> store or something, I always think like, holy cow, I could, I could send a package out one day and it would arrive at this podunk little location yep. the following day within 24 hours that's amazing actually i don't know how they do it but yeah it's fantastic uh, that they can do it let's uh let's do a little little uh i guess convince wally to use redline what makes redline better than any other shipping method shipping company out there well, um, you know, we, we do use the FedEx system. So um, they do a very nice job. Their tracking is, I feel, superior to a U.S. Postal. Um, it's very similar to UPS, for sure. The thing about UPS, though, is they don't allow snakes. And UPS does not support the reptile industry. There are lizard folks and gecko folks, frog folks, aquatics folks that use UPS. Okay. It's a very similar service and result to FedEx. But FedEx specifically supports uh, the reptile industry, and I appreciate that. They don't exclude uh, snakes. And they, they have a live animal desk at FedEx, a, a staff of people that specifically work on shipping live animals. Now, wow. they let us focus on reptiles. If you call FedEx Live Animal Desk and say, I want, I want to ship a snake or a lizard or, you know, a gecko or whatever, they'll say, call Redline Shipping, they'll take care of you. The Live Animal Desk ships porpoises and giraffes and gorillas and uh, walruses and all kinds. They do tons of horses, which is a really fascinating process. I, I'll tell you about sometime. Um, but they have infrastructure that makes it, that supports live animal shipping. UPS doesn't have that. So I prefer the, uh, the FedEx service over UPS. Um, with a service like Redline, I think one of the best values that we offer is the customer service side. So when you have questions about how to package, how to ship, how to execute, um, where is my package? My package is late. Um, where, Which hub can I ship to? Help me find it. Um, walk me through the process. All of those customer service aspects, we excel at that. You can't call FedEx and get any of those questions answered. They can't tell you how to ship a bearded dragon or a leopard gecko or anything else. We can do that. We can walk folks through that, uh, that process. Um, the next thing would be uh, you probably everybody's number one concern, which would be the price. Uh, we give a very good discount off of the FedEx retail rate. So originally with uh, pro exotics, I was shipping about $30,000 a year in shipping service, you know, for our animals. And we got, uh, you know, at the time it was a 25% discount. So when we started shipping reptiles, I said, hey, we're going to give everybody a 30% discount. <laughs> so whether you ship once a year or a thousand times a year, you're already getting a really strong discount. You know, great. Um, as, you know, prices have gone up, they go up every single year without fail. Um, when I when I launched Redline, I said we're going to start at forty percent. So for Express, we offer a forty percent discount off the retail rate, and then depending on your volume, depending on your need, depending on your previous provider, or whatever, I'm happy to work with everybody on a, on a custom discount. 
and and get them pricing that's going to work. If you if you are shipping lots of uh, the animals out every week or every month or every year or every season, um, I want to make sure that we can get you in a price that's going to work for you. So the discount is is a is probably the number one focus of everybody. My number one focus is customer service. Everybody else, you know, the, the customer's focus is typically going to be the price. Well, we can work on that. Um, and I mentioned coupons. You can use the code ROBIN60 and get 60% off of two shipments when you start. And and if you're, if you're a private business, if you want to get a 60% discount from FedEx as a private individual, you better be shipping $800,000 in packages a year. Like that's a steep, steep discount. So the discount that we can offer is, is, is going to be greater than what you're going to be able to get going with a direct account. So that's very significant. And then, of course, the packaging. We provide packaging um, from boxes to heat packs to face packs to reptile bags and all the supporting uh, uh, products of that. Um, but how do I get Wally to switch? Before I don't you know. go there, think about that for just a second. Can you repeat yeah. that discount code for me, Robin? And Frank, the tank, can you put that in the comments for us, if you don't mind? I think it's in my description of the video, but just repeat the, the yeah, discount I'm code. It's just Robin60, and it's R-O-B-Y-N-6-0. No spaces. That's easy enough. Yep, easy enough. And you can redeem it twice. I wanted to give it, you know, it's a really strong discount. <laughs> it's absolutely bonkers. And I wanted to give, you know, folks a chance to redeem it twice. So, yes, you can redeem Robin 62 times. Thank you. Um, so you you guys ship U.S. Postal primarily. You, right? We do. We ship USPS. We have, I, I've got to say above and beyond, we have just the greatest people that we work with, you know, on, on a day, I was going to say daily, but Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, when we take packages and they're just wonderful, wonderful people. Um, but we've, you know, you were talking about the success rate um, shipping through Redline and it's a, a fraction, you know, mm -hmm. um, I would have to say ours is like that too. Um, we just don't, we don't have <clears throat> problems and I'm not, you know, glorifying USPS. What I am doing is saying we're, we've been very, very, very lucky with, with shipping the way that we've been shipping. And so um, educate me a little bit here. Yep. Um, number one, relationships are incredibly important. So if you do have a local station there and you guys have great relationship, I mean, that's that's worth a lot. That carries a ton of weight. And I appreciate that. And that's what we strive to do with our customers, have great relationships, right? You want to support them so they can be successful. So what is the service that you ship w with? Is it uh, uh, Priority Express? Priority Express, mm -hmm. and that goes overnight to any address in the lower forty-eight. There are a couple areas that will be marked a two-day ship. Okay, <clears throat> but it covers most, right? It co covers ninety. I would say ninety-seven percent of everything is overnight. Next to say. <laughs> Now, having said that, I will throw in that last the last year or so we're seeing that number slip a little bit. So, you know, two-day shipments are um, starting to become more common. I'd still mm -hmm. say that we're probably 60 to 75 percent. Uh, I, I need to look at the numbers, but 60 to 75 percent are one days and the rest are two days. I will tell you, though, the last few shipments that we had did go flip back to the overnight. I OK, think OK. I think they've rectified some of that. OK. And what do you do for packaging? Do you use the U.S. Postal Box or you do your own boxes? I do a mix. Okay. It depends on um, if it's isopods, I use their priority box. And sure. those go priority. If it's an animal, it's always express. I tend to use their express box because it's already labeled express. It's already yeah. all the attention is on that box already. We use Amazon boxes and I just tape over Amazon. No, I don't. No, I don't. Don't. <laughs> I have a, don't I have a specific Sorry. FAQ on our site that says absolutely no Amazon boxes or U.S. postal boxes allowed. So, yeah. you know, for FedEx, the 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 box itself has a requirement yes. for a 225-pound burst weight. Right. Which is a typical cardboard thickness. But, like, the Amazon boxes are thinner cardboard. Yeah, and the U.S. Postal boxes are very thin cardboard. So 
the box itself. So some people go to the post office and get boxes and then put, you know, insulation inside and, and then want to use them through our service. It causes two issues. Number one, it doesn't meet the, the requirement from FedEx. Right. Yep. Um, and number two, um, it's a U.S. postal box. And, you know, for whatever reason, uh, FedEx doesn't like that. No, they shouldn't like that. <laughs> they, 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 and, and, you know, and that brings up something else about boxes and stuff. Um, the, going back to the other issue you had about what's the common mistakes. Yeah. Labeling, labeling of the box is a common mistake. People put, you know, handle with care, live snakes. Or, you know, uh, live reptiles. And they put in big red letters across the box. And I understand they mean well. Um, but that kind of labeling and a U.S. postal box in, inside the FedEx system, it only attracts negative attention. That's all it does. You know, it, it triggers phobias is what it does. I never want you to say on the side of the box, live snake. Not not in big letters. There's Lasiak labeling where you have to put the quantity and the species. Yes. But that should be small and in the labeling area. Not not in giant red marker across. No. Handle with care. Watch out. Live snake. Mm -mm. No, 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 no. Mm -hmm. I, I have a conversation <laughs> with one of my tarantula shippers. And we talked about boxes. And he thought, bless his heart, he was fairly, he's, he's only been in the industry a few years. He's very, very successful. He's been fantastic success. But he thought, wouldn't it be great if I made a custom box and it had a big giant picture of a tarantula on the side? And I thought, no, that's a terrible idea. Please no. don't do that. Because uh -uh. the, the only thing that people are more phobic about than snakes would be spiders. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's weird the way the human brain works, but just the picture of a snake or picture of a spider freaks a lot of people out. And I, it's not it's not right. It's not correct. It's not acceptable. But boxes get mishandled and drop kicked and thrown and all kinds of poor handling because it's got a picture of a snake or a picture of a spider. Mm -hmm. Um you know, so I always discourage people from trying to draw attention to their live box using things that, that trigger phobias. I, uh, I cannot that. tell you how many years I have spent saying exactly that. Really? <laughs> so much resistance. So much yeah. resistance. I, I've given up, Robin. I, I've <laughs> just said, you know, do what you want. But being a baggage, uh, a package handler, for, uh, I worked at Gander Mountain, and I knew, you know, I would put things, and if something came over as fragile, I'd, I'd see my coworker throw it as far into the truck as it, <clears throat> and and it, there's nothing right about that. There's nothing right about that in my mind, but I've seen it, and I know if something like that is big, tarantula, a picture of a tarantula, are you kidding me? They're going to handle it differently. Yep. And not in a good not, way. Not in a good way. Yes. And and I guess what it, it's just some bizarre human nature, isn't it, Wally? That yeah. when it says fragile, there's a there's 10% of the population that's like, you know what? I'm about to fuck this up. Game on, boys. Game yeah. on. Watch this. Hold I'm my gonna, beer. I'm watch gonna this. Shake the shit out of it and see what's in there. Yeah, it's it's not right. And it's no. not acceptable. And it's it's unfortunate, but Hey, this is, yes, this is the reality. I, I, I tell people, there's nothing you can add to the box that's going to get you red velvet pillow service. Nothing. No. No. The only thing adding to the box, the only result it can possibly create is a negative result. Yes. As far as I'm concerned, I want FedEx to handle this package like the 5 million other packages tonight, get it through the system, get it out the door, get it delivered on time. We're good. The packaging, the guidelines, they take care of the rest. I don't want special handling. When you write uh, keep cool, that might have somebody pull it out of the system and put it in the cooler. Yes, yeah, yes. I don't want that. Yeah. When you write keep warm, people don't know what warm is. Mm -mm. I don't want them pulling it out of the system and putting it on top of the radiator in the office mm -mm. because it's a live animal. They want to make sure it stays warm. Mm -mm. No, 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 no. Just let it move through the system like normal. 
I don't so, want any special attention. Just let it fly through the system, deliver on time tomorrow. Uh, that would be fantastic. Yeah. This There's session can do to add to the benefit no, of handling. No. This session is so valuable, but I tell you what, this last minute and a half, yeah. if you not watch nothing else in this show, that right there, the last minute and a half, make that package disappear. Make it disappear. Um, you don't want anybody to see it and, and single it out. Just it, flow it right through. Yep. That's my right thought. Through. Yep. Absolutely. So how much time do we have, Wally? It, I'm over my time that I committed to you. I said an hour and a half, and now I'm over. So okay. up to you. it's up to you. I, oh, good. Mike would say 24 hours, but it's up to you. Oh, good. So I'm going to make some cheesy business pitches here, and then I'm going to I'm going to engage you on a different topic. Okay. If you didn't, I was going to tell you to at the end of the show. So, all right. So we just launched our Redline Rewards program. You earn points by purchasing labels or packaging. You can redeem points on labels or packaging, um, just like a credit card's reward system. Very excited about that. So every time you spend money at Redline, you earn points and you can redeem them later. Done. Uh, I think we're number one in reptile shipping now. Uh, I couldn't be more happy about that. It took one year. It's faster than I anticipated. I'm very excited, very proud wow. about that. We have an awesome team. Done. Um, our insurance program is great. Done. Uh, busy season's coming up. Uh, September, October, first half of November is the busiest time of shipping for the year. Um, so folks should prepare for that. Uh, get your packaging in hand before. You need to ship tomorrow, um, you know, order your packaging in advance. Um, and keep in mind, as you work to uh, Cyber Week, uh, post Thanksgiving, and uh, in December, the systems get absolutely bogged down with uh, presents and gifts and all that other junk. And you actually don't want to be shipping live animals during those times. So we have notices on the, on the website. We have no ship periods because there's so many uh, you know, books and uh, batteries and presents and nonsense in the system. We don't want our gecko packages to be delayed. Yes. So that's it. Now, you said, Wally, you had an interesting Van Halen story for me. Oh, my gosh. Oh, oh my gosh. I almost that. forgot. I'm so glad that you brought that up. Yeah. So I'm okay. a huge Van Halen fan. Now, you know, have... It's the best band of all time. We can argue that if you want, but I'd rather yeah, hear. I think they're great. Party. They're just under Led Zeppelin and Pink Floyd. So, yeah, I half agree with you on that. Um, right. Okay, you want to hear my Van Halen uh, story? I grew I up do. in a small town in southern Wisconsin. Some of you, some of our viewers have heard this. I'm going to repeat myself. So, my friend and I are bar hopping one night. You know, we're we're 18, Wisconsin. That was legal back then. This is 78. A long time. 78. Ago. So you know yeah, where Van you know, Halen. That's last that's last century, Wally. I know. That's <laughs> not even this century. Aren't we? We're old. That's 108 point, years right? ago. That's, yes. Yes, I'm that old. So 78, you know where Van Halen was in 78. They had not even released their first album. That's we're bar hopping and, and Hooker Lake Inn in Silver Lake. I wasn't. We're just, you. I know, but you know Silver Lake yep. or Hooker Lake Inn. So we're <clears> bopping around, a big volleyball bar kind of softball place. Big, big stage. They have, you know, local acts once in a while. So we're running around. Greg, where do you want to go? Well, let's go to Hooker Lake. Okay, let's uh, back in the car, Hooker Lake in, and, and the place is packed. What the heck is going on? Our This is this is our place. Why so many people? Van Halen. Who the, who the heck is Van Halen? No way are we walking into this crowded place to see this band. We don't even know. And <laughs> off we went to another you bar. Didn't know it. Honest to flipping gosh. You right? skipped it. Right? Is that stupid? Or we didn't know at the time. And then you know, running with the devil and oh my mind-blowing music, just oh my god. I thought this story was gonna have a happy ending. It, I didn't know it, it doesn't. It's a very, very sad, sad ending. Oh, Except goodness. for you do like them. So I do I do blame Greg for making that decision, and he still blames me for making the decision, and we'll never get over that. Wouldn't uh, that be cool? Life. See him in a small bar somewhere. There, there couldn't have been, you know, the parking lot was full, obviously, and all the way down the street and everything. I bet you there was maybe four or 500 people in there. 
and that didn't like attract you to stick out and find no, out what was, it was going our place. On. We're not walking into a bar that's packed like that. Are you kidding? That's well. I mean, technically, walk. I would have I would have ran away as well. I'm not really big on crowds like that. But uh, boy, the opportunity. I mean, I I'm sure that the guys were probably driving around in a van, yeah. just stopping around in the country, like you know, self supported, like any struggling band is at the time. Mm -hmm. But yeah, what an opportunity. Yeah. Did, did you have, did you have a fun night anyway? Like we could remember back then, we, uh, the times were different. The times were different. This is a small, you know, out in the county kind of growing up. By the time we got home, we were probably so blasted. Unfortunately, not good folks. Don't be doing what I did. Um, we were so blasted. We didn't know where we were that night. You know, anyway, well, the, well, the place was named after hookers. So it must have been a wild area. Yeah. Yeah, I think we <laughs> named it after our ex escapades there. Yeah, unfortunately, right. <laughs> wrong. <laughs> oh, so, those were the days. That's my sad story. Sorry to. So, when end. did you, uh, Wally? When did you graduate high school? Seventy-eight. Seventy-eight. Okay, this is ten years ahead of me. I was in eighty-eight. So, just for you know, conversation here. Than me. What, what was the soundtrack of your high school years? Led Zeppelin. Oh, yeah, it was everything was Led Zeppelin back Deep then. Deep Purple, Deep Purple, yeah. Um, Machine Head. Um, oh gosh, yeah. Um, Alice Cooper was really big. Um, yeah. Sure. And then you know, Pink Floyd, obviously. After that. Yeah, yeah. Beatles were what? already pretty much done. You know, everybody was off the Beatles and Rolling Stones, or is that not so down much? Period? Yeah, not around us. The Stones really weren't weren't listened to that much. But I tell you what, when Van Halen hit the scenes, uh, Ted Nugent. Ted Nugent was another big one. Yeah. Uh, but when Van Halen hit, you know, it was like burn these other C or albums. They're garbage. Albums. They weren't CDs. Yeah, they weren't then. CDs back then. Yeah. So my my older brother turned me on to Van Halen in uh, 1982 or 83, maybe. Okay. Gave me. Um, I think Van Halen one and and then Diver Down, uh, both amazing albums. And so yeah, I, I became instant huge fan. Um, but you know, in the eighties, so my soundtrack was all, you know, hair metal. So Poison, yes. Motley yes. Crue, mm -hmm. uh, Van Halen. Yes, that was more the gist of my stuff. When when uh, you were growing up back then, I bet you you looked just like Twisted Sister. <laughs> there are there are some pictures on my Facebook of me with long hair. Yes, outstanding. I yeah, did well. Have. Yes, because I I desperately wanted to be Bon Jovi at the time. <laughs> you know, Wally. You know, you make as a teenager, you have to discover yourself. You do. Yeah, you have Nobody's to discover your you. style. Yes. And you make some really bad choices. So, <laughs> I mean, John Bon Jovi looked really, really cool in his jeans tucked into his cowboy boots. He, he was cool. Yeah. In my Hawaii high school, I looked really, really ridiculous wearing <laughs> jeans tucked into cowboy boots. In hindsight, this was a poor choice. And to make it worse... They didn't sell cowboy boots in Hawaii. <laughs> so when I went and visited some family in Nebraska, oh, God, I can't really, you really. Feel. I went to Walmart and I bought cowboy boots in a uh, vinyl cowboy boots, you know, pleather. Yeah. <laughs> so they weren't even good cowboy boots. They were yeah, vinyl cowboy boots from Walmart. But I was the only person in town that had cowboy boots in Walmart. Walmart. So. Wasn't it Kmart back then or Zare? Or? It could have been. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it was small town Nebraska, so it might yeah. well have been. But, I mean, yeah, I looked absolutely ridiculous. But, yeah, you know, you're, you're trying to find your way. I grew my hair out. I could reach behind my back and hold, you know, the back of my hair. It was long enough uh, to grab. I could never get it as... as Beautifully styled and gorgeous as John Bon Jovi, but you know we all we all tried. Well, he had the poof going too. But you oh know, yes. lately there's been a lot of memes going back on Facebook with Darian and Mickey, and you know different pictures. So tomorrow, that's what I'm working on. I'm going to pull out my uh, Photoshop and I'm going to go back to this in the last two minutes. <laughs> you and you'll throw some long over. hair on me. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that would be amazing. Yep. 
There, let's let's give you a still that you can use. Let's do it. There we go. Got it. <laughs> I'm picking pictures in my mind. So ridiculous. So ridiculous. But you know what? So much fun. Oh my gosh. Wouldn't and I'm sure we're, I think you're always going to be biased to your youth, but I mean, when I listen to the music today, there's not a lot that's better than 80s and some 90s music. Today's music just doesn't hit for me. So, um, yeah, it you always go back to those formative years. years, you know? Yeah, and I've I've listened, I've changed a little bit of my music tastes over the years, but I still go back to Pink Floyd, and yeah. I'll throw that... I'll throw that on if I'm kind of sitting here working on something and kind of letting it go. But if I'm downstairs, I'm hitting ACDC and I'm rocking and, oh my God. and it just motivates me to to kind of do, go slow. faster because I am very slow downstairs. Yeah. ACDC is amazing. But, uh, you know, I do have some appreciation for today. Um, Adele is amazing. I mean, she's an amazing singer. And I'm not sure if you're going to goof on me or not, but... Um, I, I swear to God, if you say Taylor Swift, I'm I'm ending the <laughs> broadcast right now. I admire what she's done. Yes, you know, I do too. I, I love a lot of Beyonce songs, but um, Miley Cyrus. I'm a huge Miley Cyrus fan. She has got some really great music, and it seems absolutely ridiculous. I would be a fan, but you know, she did a special with Dolly Parton. Um, oh, loved it. Did yeah. you watch that? Yeah. Yeah, I I thought it was. Oh, she's she's the real deal. I mean, she's got she's got roots. I'm not a Hannah Montana fan. Let's just be no, clear. No. Yeah, yeah. That's not the era I'm talking about. But yeah, there, there's some there's some modern artists that I can uh, I can get down with. But it still always goes back to Van Halen, uh, Motley Crue. Uh, I saw Motley Crue a few years ago here in Denver. Big fire show, like you know, flames jumping out from everywhere, and Nikki Six with the bass oh. that shot flames out. I mean, it was one of the best best shows I've ever seen. I mean, outstanding. It just, yeah, it's so fantastic. So I'll I'll share with you one more story, and then I'm going to call it a night here, Audie Robin. All right. But, uh, one of the best shows I've ever gone to. So I went through the hard rock and and the classic rock, and then went through the country and western, Willie and Waylon. And that's about the time we met and, and Barbara Mandrell and Eddie Rabbit and Barbara so, Kenny Rogers. Right? So what was I thinking? Sorry, no offense. Uh, hey, so, I wasn't the fan originally. You got me hooked on Waylon and Willie. So Willie, we went to a concert, a country concert, and I don't know oh. what in my mind <laughs> made me agree to going. We went to Billy Ray Cyrus. It was and a cheap ticket Mr. at the fair. Mr. Achy Breaky Heart. <laughs> yeah. And to be very honest, it was a blast going. And he, he actually did, if I remember right, a Led Zeppelin song. And it was yeah. like, this is pretty cool. I don't mind being at this concert. Was so right. that was fun. Very nice. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of uh, great shows I've seen over the years. Um, being a Led Zeppelin fan, I'm not sure if this ever hit your radar, there was a band that did reggae covers of Led Zeppelin called Dread Zeppelin. Did you ever listen to them? I have not. No. Is it good? No. Um, I mean, you'll Different. either love it or hate it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but Dread Dread Zeppelin. You, I'm not sure if it's on Spotify or, or you're going to have to go to the uh, the weirdo uh, re uh, exclusive record store to find it. I'm not sure, but. I remember I listened to Dread Zeppelin for quite some time. Dread Zeppelin. I'll I'll look it up on YouTube after the show and I'll <laughs> give you, you my opinion. There you go. If it's not good, your your picture will be on Facebook tomorrow with the uh, long hair. And... <laughs> well, it was in the it was in the early nineties. So again, time has passed and uh, I I maybe had bad judgment. We'll see. Uh, we all had bad judgment back then. Oh good lord, yes. Robin, anything you want to leave our viewers with? Anything that we forgot to talk about? Anything about Redline shipping uh, that you'd like to mention? Where can we find you uh, both online and where can we find you in person to say hi and thank you for your wonderful services? All right. Uh, RedlineShipping.com is, is uh, the shipping website. Uh, RedlineScience.com is our product website for uh, scrapers, cleaners, stainless steel tools, and things like that. Reptile Report is on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, see some just amazing uh, photos and videos from across the uh, reptile uh, invert and sometimes aquatics world. Um, and then uh, we are a sponsor of the NARBC shows. So we're at all the NARBC shows, Tenley Park, Arlington's coming up next. 
uh, St. Louis, uh, November. We just did Schaumburg, where I got to meet uh, the icon Wally Kern. Um, I'll be doing the Phoenix Expo as well, so we'll get out there. We just were at uh, Pomona Super Show. Ah. Um, yeah, uh, I have a love hate thing with shows. You know, I, I if I could do three a year, I'd probably be pretty happy. But that's not my life anymore. I do maybe eleven or twelve, which seems like a lot. Until you talk to Tristan, who does a hundred shows. No, I nobody can sustain that. It, it's just nuts. He's going right. to have to hire staff like crazy. He oh yeah, it's, I I just can't fathom uh, doing that. But I feel like I travel enough already. But uh, yeah. yeah, those are the sites you can find me. And I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. Living the social media life. But uh, yeah, it's been a great uh, long journey. And uh, yeah, we're gonna do this till the day we die. It's all about passion, and you certainly have passion for what you're doing. And as a member of the community, I'd like to thank you once again for all that you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, well, thank meeting, you. I appreciate that. And I'm telling drive. you, it's, it was a genuine great surprise to meet you at Schaumburg. Um, I've always had interest in, in connecting with you, and this has been a, a great time uh, spending with you here. I appreciate you both very much. Thanks. It Our was pleasure great. entirely. If people have more questions, uh, you can send them over to me. You can send them to Robin, um, or we'll have Robin on at a later time sometime if we want to get into more details about shipping. If yeah, that's we're just talking about Van Halen, whatever. And oh, Van know. Halen, I like that. I yeah, just like play that. that music. In the Robin, thank you very much. This All has right. been a pleasure. Good night, Thanks, guys. Good night. Good night. Bye bye, everyone.